is record button so that anyone who is late joining us can get everything from the beginning. All right. Super. Hi, Nari. <laughs> I see my former student, Nari, jumping in on the, the list. Okay. From Oshkosh Bagash. Sorry, Sarah, go ahead. That's okay. I just want to do a brief hello and welcome to everyone. Great to see that we have participants joining us from all over the world today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. On behalf of Contact North, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, How Faculty Can Harness Generative AI for Enhanced Learning, Part 2. My name is Sarah Gover. I'm the Director of Teach Online and the Online Learning News at Contact North, and I'll be hosting the session today. Just want to start off with a provincial land acknowledgement, respectfully acknowledging that Contact North's work and the work of our community partners takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across the province. We are grateful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to strengthen Ontario and all communities across the province. So just a quick few things before we begin. Um, the chat is open. Just remember to select everyone on the pull down menu. Um, so this is Zoom webinar that we're using. So mics and audio is, uh, or sorry, mics and video is off for participants. Um, there will be time at the end of the session for uh, Q&A. Just remember to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use the chat um, for any comments and uh, Kurt will be using it for some interactive parts as well. So I wanna mention we have closed captioning. Um, if you not see it automatically uh, popping up, it's, uh, there's a uh, closed caption uh, icon at the bottom of your screen, just click on that. And once the webinar has finished, the link in, to the recording and the slides will be posted on teachonline.ca and I'll put that link in the chat momentarily and we'll also get emailed out to you in about 24 hours. All right, that's it from me on to the main event. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today and welcome him back, Dr. Curtis J. Bung, professor at the School of Education and adjunct professor at the School of Informatics at Indiana University. Thanks for coming back, Kurt. Always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. Always great to be here. So, I guess this is the part where I take over, huh, Sarah? I thought you were going to deliver the whole hour. <laughs> no, that's it. No one wants to hear me speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just making sure. Just making sure. Or you're trying to make me official Canadian. I've been presenting so many times in Canada over the past couple of decades about e-learnings. Canadians are habit. They are always one step ahead of everyone else when it comes to e-learning, distance learning, blended learning. Well, what You have it. Uh, today, I'm going to, I have a couple of different frameworks. Today, I'm going to go through something new, and I'd like for you to kind of get set up for it. So if you have a sheet of paper nearby, if you could put in four quadrants the four areas of this talk, which would be motivation, creative thinking, critical thinking, and collaborative learning. And if you don't have a piece of paper that big, you can take a little small piece of paper and just type mo and CR and CT and collaborate, whatever, in four quadrants. And I want you to kind of uh, indicate which of the ideas you might be able to use from this session in each of those quadrants. And in the overlap, some of those apply to many quadrants, just put them in the middle. And at the end, we'll kind of get a sense of what people got gathered from this talk. So it's not real fancy. I'm not an artist, and probably many of you are not. And I'm sure all of you are a better artist than I am. Hi, Shishuen Liu from Pennsylvania. My former advisor is with us as well. Lots of people here. I already got 44 messages in the chat window I haven't opened up, including those from Lena, who's my visiting scholar from China. Um, so I did two talks, well, one talk in the fall on AI pedagogy. I did several talks on motivation in online environments a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, did others related to podcasting and other kinds of things. Those are all recorded and available for you. Uh, Sarah asked me to do part two of my talk on AI pedagogy, and I've gathered dozens of ideas, 65 actually, and I don't know if we'll go through all 65. Share.com, trainingshare.com, one word, go to archive talks. You can have the original slides. 
go to the website for this um, particular talk at Contact North, they're going to have the PDFs of the talk available and the video will be available. Um, and, or just write to me or write to Sarah uh, if you can't find it. So again, my, you can go to Training Share, you can go to Contact North with the, the, the original link that you signed in on. So there are many ways to get and access some of these contents. There are a couple of books that I utilize uh, for each of these talks and they're free to downloads. And the links, if I did use um, free books or technical reports and so forth, the links will be in the PDF or be in the slides. So download the originals. You can get the um, whole hundred one idea book for using ChatGPT, for instance. So I'm going to share my screen at this point and say, welcome, everyone. It, 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 whether you're a former student, current student, or friend, or future student, or just curious observers, it's great to have you with us today. And um, we'll see if we we can grab this and go. Okay, so this is part two on our talk about the use of AI-enhanced pedagogy, right? And so in this particular talk, and I'm going to, at this point, hide my uh, upper screen, my floating panel, so that I can um, have more available to me. I can see more. Um, there we go. Uh, so this is the, the website that you signed in on to get to access to this. First, we have a, a question here, Sarah. We need to get a polling question up. Um, have you discovered or used a different generative AI tool since I was here last? <laughs> Um, yes or no, since I was here in late November, have you discovered anything new? I'm just curious. And I'll let um, Sarah end the polls, I guess. Um, we've got, everybody answered the question, Sarah. We've got 50, oh, well, 57 out of 113, not everyone, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so do you want me to stop the share here at this point? I guess I could and then share the results. And as you can see, some of you were, a lot of you are here, 60% of those that answered that question. So we can go to question number two, Sarah. Um, I don't know if I have to get rid of. The oh, I got it. I'm, I'm uh... okay. Sorry, if you want to post this again, I didn't see, I don't see it. There, there we, we go. go. Have you used a generative AI tool or platform for any of your formal informal learning since um, this is for learning. Okay, and we've got 114 people here out of 302 that signed up at this point. And you wanna also handle this one and end the poll here in a second? Um, Sounds good, just let me know when you want me to stop okay. it. Okay, I'll let you know. We're still getting, we've got, no, we've got enough. We got 84 people. So yeah, once you stop and once you share results, and as you can see, we've got 59% have been losing it as a learner. We can go to the next slide and uh, we all get the next poll up there, Sarah. You wanna control that or do I have to? Okay, there we go. Um, have you used ChatGPT or other generative tools for innovative teaching in the past few months? No, yes, a few times, many times. Okay, quite a variety here. And it's about half, well, a little more than half of you, okay. Some of you dabbled, did it once, about 10% of you, about 40% a few times, another 10% many times. And only one person, one person has tried something out from part one. Uh, it's not so good, Sarah, I guess. <laughs> okay, you can share the results there and, and we can take those away. Um, so we'll move on and I'll get out of the screen there. You know, you're not the only ones using ChatGPT or generative AI. K-12 teachers are using it for lesson plans, for doing their own research, for synthesizing information, for generating assignments uh, and tests. Students also are using it 73% to help them understand material or help them learn more in expeditious fashion. In fact, more and more students, high school students, uh, are using ChatGPT more than they are human tutors oftentimes. And it's particularly true in math and science areas. It's cheaper, it's quicker, it's faster, it's anonymous, but also in higher education settings. The, the reports vary here, but at least half of instructors in one report said they're using it, and a third of those would consider, uh, 
of those who aren't will consider in the future. Other studies show a little less impressive numbers um, that are international in nature, where the US might be lagging a little bit behind, but 38% of students in one study from, from the United States, compared to 11 other countries, were using generative AI tools and techniques. 46% um, of those said that it should enhance, and it can enhance, and it will enhance interactivity. 38% helping them generate ideas, and one in three think it's going to be a revolution be a revolution, a transformation, but higher ed, people don't agree, 16% think it's gonna be a revolution. So we've got some contrast between students who think this is the big deal, this is coming, this is gonna change life as we know it, as a student, as a, as, as a formal educational setting. Not so fast, administrators slow down and slow down the reins, right? So we got some little difference here in the optimism, right? Well, if you really want the inside scoop, if you really want to know what's going to happen, you're going to contact North and read their reports. They got a report here, five steps to leverage ChatGPT in your teaching. They got another one for 10 ideas. They got tons of stuff. It's all free. If you have not checked out Contact North and the resources there, and also the Commonwealth of Learning, check out the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver. Two wonderful resources from Canada. As I said, the Canadians are way ahead of everybody else. And Sam Nadu is probably here. And I know John Mason and Charles Darwin, Sam and Melbourne. The Australians and the Canadians are always leading the way in the distance learning, online learning, educational technology, one way, shape or form. And so read what they're doing, right? Uh, and you'll be impressed. And in particular, uh, Commonwealth of Learning, col.org and Contact North, because it's free. It's free, you know? And we might... Well, I did just before this session started, give a little nudge to Sarah to bring Ron Oosten from York, who spoke to my class on Monday and spoke last semester about the new AI Tutor Pro. You, um, so as Bo said, thanks Bo for the little plug for um, AI Tutor Pro, helping you build new knowledge and the AI Teaching Assistant Pro, your personalized teaching assistant to help you with any subject, any topic, easily create multiple choice tests and exams, um, develop thick course descriptions, whatever you want. This is a free AI assistant at your side utilizing the ChatGPT technologies, right? Um, and so we've got these cool tools right in front of us that we need to start utilizing and start experimenting with. Since I was on in November, there was an announcement that OpenAI formed a partnership with Arizona State, just like Starbucks had in the past and other entities because Arizona State's always, if it's in the United States, it's at Arizona State or Indiana, but it's definitely at Arizona State. Those are the places that are pushing ahead. Um, we have got a lot of AI grants here in Indiana, so we're another place that is pushing the envelope, right? And so also since I spoke last time, you've got the first AI bots, first AI students in a University of Michigan, Ferris State University is gonna have AI bots within their online courses, eventually within face-to-face -face courses. So we've got new partnerships, we've got new students, and now we've got AI teaching courses. Otterman's Institute has taken a bold step in transforming the educational landscape as it has AI-powered teachers. I think Arizona State is experimenting with this too with the 100 Million Learner Project. If you take, go to the website, type 100 Million Learner, um, they have four or five free classes that try and help people in disadvantaged countries in the Global South in particular. Otterman's Institute is been successful, 94% success rate where AI is grading the paper, 35,000 students working with governments from and UN bodies from 13 countries providing education and training services. So we've got a lot of innovation happening. We've got some people who are restricting it and not allowing students to utilize ChatGPT for their assignments. But other people say, why not? Why not? We need to rethink education as we know it. We need to rethink what's happening out there. For some, ChatGPT is as exciting as a Twinkie. <laughs> For others, this is the new, this is a new deal. This is, this is where I'm gonna spend a lot of my time. I'm speaking for everyone around, not myself. In the future, experimenting with this new possibility for enhancing, augmenting, transforming, learning. And the Chronicle of Higher Education in the US is, been pretty good at summarizing, at um, interviewing people who are dabbling in this area of the use of generative AI technologies in their classroom. And so if you're not 
looking at the Chronicle of Higher Ed. It should be a place you take a uh, you look at. Inside Higher Ed in the U.S. is also good. Go to the Conversation in um, Australia. The Conversation's free. Go to the Evolution with three L's in Canada. There's all sorts of places to kind of get upskilled and reskilled and find out what's going on and to think about what how am I going to use ChatGPT? Maybe our students will use it to help them with their study skills and and planning and so forth. And I think that's a really important area in which we start have to start thinking about um, as a supplemental or augmentative aid, right? Um, so helping students figure out their learning plans and scheduling and structuring their learning plans. Um, but having them just brainstorm lists, a brainstorming tool. So I'm you know, going back here to this four part that I talked about earlier. If you haven't got a sheet of paper and just put a M, for Mo, Mo for motivation, CT for critical thinking, CR for creative thinking, and um, CL for collaborative learning, just a four quadrant little piece of paper in front of you. You might get a bigger piece of paper like this. And I'm not an artist, but you know, take a second and just draw something up and I'm gonna go through hopefully all 65, but maybe 40 of the ideas here today. And at the end, we'll kind of get a sense of which one, what you got a lot out of today. Now, last time I went through my R2-D2 book and idea, read, reflect, display, and do my Star Wars model with all of you, but you don't need to hear about that anymore. So I won't do that one. Boop. And I also, so that has, that book has a hundred ideas for teaching with technology. Um, it's getting a little old, 2008. This book here, Adding Tech Variety 2014 is free, um, has 10 motivational principles. It's translated to Chinese for free. And if you're coming from, uh, Chinese speaking country. Um, this has been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. I've made this book free because I told people of the Philippines, I'm not going to make them pay anymore because my publisher is price gouging. So I, I wrote this book purposely for free as those 10 principles of motivation, tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomy, relevance, interactivity, engagement, tension, unit, unit product, tech variety. Has a hundred things plus variations, 200 free ideas. Well, Last year, the Commonwealth of Learning created a new version of that book and a free class on how to motivate online. So if you, you, you go to my homepage, you can download the new book um, as well. So you can get three different books off of my homepage, that are, um, well, two different books and actually a free new research, a special issue of the research in online learning um, that you can download as well. So I'm giving you free, free, free. Sarah said, if I say free, 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 three times say free, I'll get good evaluations today. So this new version of the same book is called Motivating and Supporting Online Learning. My colleague Elaine Co in New Zealand and I have done both versions of that book. So we go to poll four. Um, I wanna know which area are you most interested in? Creative thinking, cre critical thinking, collaborative learning, motivation. Which are area you're most interested in learning or fostering in your students? <laughs> Maybe none of the above. Oh, that's the wrong question, but that's okay. Hmm. We'll get the answers to this one. And we'll see if we can. That's, this is the final clue. So, um, so actually, let's close out of that, Sarah, because that's the last question of today. Sorry, so we, hot, hot on the trigger here. Okay, I got to end yeah. that one. Yeah, that I one. ended it. Yeah. So long let's, time. Yeah. Sorry about that. There yeah, we there. go. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. It's keeping making sure I'm awake, right, Sarah? I'm not a robot. <laughs> that's right. I'm making sure keeping you on I'll, your toes. How would ChatGPT have handled that? <laughs> okay, interesting. And this is what I would have expected, sort of. Right. What we have so far, we have 86 out of 124. We're up to 124 people. Good deal. Okay. Almost half, getting close to half of the people who enrolled, maybe about, you know, about 40%, right? So well, let's... Let a couple more, come on, a couple more people have to fill this out, let's go. Come on, we're at 88, come on, we gotta keep going, 89, 90, 90, okay, now we can stop it. All right, we got 90 people. As you can see, critical thinking, as not too surprising, collaborative learning, number two. Creative thinking, motivation, uh, well, so about 10%, but yeah, critical thinking. A lot of techniques today will relate to critical thinking and um, you'll see that, I think, but uh, you'll have to decide. I've, de I've decided not to label them, at least most of them, as CR, CT, CL, or motivation. I've decided not to. 
Now, I saw my former student, Nari Kim, is in here from Oshkosh. She knows all the answers. So if you want to know what the, she's got, you know, just text her because, you know, Nari knows everything. <laughs> just kidding you, Nari. Okay. So we got the four quadrants, the four pieces of the puzzle that we got to fit together here and think about how we want to create a learning environment that both captures the, the enthusiasm of the students, it stimulates their curiosity, motivation, as well as fosters some divergence and divergent thinking and flexibility in thinking, creative thinking, entrepreneurship and innovation, as well as critical thinking, reflection, evaluation components. Now I'm a former accountant or CPA and we're told to be watchdogs of the company or the critical thinkers out there supposed to be, I'm not so sure. And then we've got the collaborative part of education, teaming, right? Those four parts. And I'm, I'm toying with this idea of M E T C three model. I'm not so sure. Motivation, educational technology, critical, creative, cooperative. I'm not sure. Sure, this will be the framework. We may have some other kind of framework that I design here and have technology integration wrapped all around that. Again, I've not published on this, or you know, full, I've taught a course for 30 years since I was eight years old related to this. I've been thinking about motivation for a long time. And again, if you've got this book, we'll go through the motivational principles for from psychologists and educational psychologists for the past 50 to 100 years are all summarized in here. That, that was the basis of this particular book, whether it's interactivity, engagement, tension, Piaget, cognitive dissonance, whether it's a goal setting or um, intrinsic motivation, the DC and Ryan research, or this you know, simple feedback mechanism via Skinner or Maslow, tone and climate, that's all in this book. So, you know, we wanna, we wanna foster that sense of, of passion for learning, right? Uh, having goal-driven learning. Humans are goal-driven creatures, but we also want inspiring environments that lead students to, you know, new and uh, original ideas that they never had before or contemplated before, maybe while working with other team members um, in, a, uh, in a collaborative activity. But they want to, after that, they want to have some convergent thinking, reflecting on the products that are being designed or produced, evaluating them, analyzing them. My master's thesis a long time ago was on divergent and convergent thinking with computer software. My dissertation was creating computer prompts and writing that were divergent and convergent and looking at students' um, changes in their manuscripts over time. Again, we want to create an environment where they share those ideas that are generated or that are evaluated, maybe in Padlet. Bo and I have been using Padlet in our classes that we've been teaching and other in Jamboard for, that's all free. And that's one way to get students across the world to collaborate and, and interact on their ideas. So I have, it's a 1025 here in the US in Eastern time zone. Um, in the next 20 or so minutes, 25 minutes, I'm gonna go through about 65 ideas or so. And some of these are my ideas including these first 16 are ones from my syllabi. I'll try and go through them relatively fast to get the other people's ideas because people don't just want bonk ideas. They want many others. So this semester, I try, Bo and I are trying something new. We have a discussion forum in Canvas, one discussion forum for humans only. And the other discussion forum, we have students generating lists using ChatGPT and BARD and, and Claude and other technology, uh, chat PDF having people utilize generative AI to, to create discussions uh, and, and critiques and lists and other things. It's really interesting. Less students are participating in the um, AI augmented discussion forum, but that's the first place that I go. And you know they, we have human to human discussion and we have AI augmented discussion. And so we have these meta lists that the students are creating in BARD. In this case, it was BARD uh, and um, in, in 2024, what questions should instructional designers and instructors ask about immersive learning environments and augmented reality? That was the topic for this week. This is just this week's um, discussion forum that I'm posting here. Another student utilized ChatGPT. Um, how can we? How can virtual reality collaborate with other forms of learning in the in the classroom? I'm not sure if I use collaborate, but it's an interesting word. And so linking in VR, AR to project-based learning and flipped learning and synchronous learning and so forth. So that's one way I'm using um, generative AI in my classroom. My students have a task coming due in a couple of weeks. 
Uh, one is just reading the news and summarizing the news and what it's saying about emerging technologies, which is the topic of the class, emerging learning technologies. And I told Macon ha have starter lists and comments from ChatGPT, just have to cite it. And so embrace ChatGPT in their learning. We have another assignment where they have to do a critique of a special issue of educational technology research and development or distance education, for which Sam Nadu is the editor. They could read a special issue. We've got Psalms in there in week 13, I think, coming up, and Sam will be a guest in the class. Um, so students can have chat GPT or chat PDF. I like chat PDF. You're limited to 100 pages of a PDF document, but it'll summarize it and um, print out questions that related to PDFs and so forth. So you can have it maybe generate starter text with quotes on your critique, or maybe, so I'm having them critique the special issue, okay? Um, and maybe interview contributors to that special issue, but even braver, so I call these brave people options, utilize ChatGPT. Instead of saying, oh, don't use it, I'm saying, you're courageous to use it. You should go for it, try it out. This is, this is the new thing, right? Even braver, even braver, you can use ChatGPT for the whole darn review and turn in ChatGPT's review along with a two or three page reflection paper or critique of what ChatGPT produced. To me, that's more exciting. To me, that's two, That's a twofer. You get two different ideas or, or products in effect. Another idea that I'm using in this class for the final assignment, I think, or one of the final assignments is having people read a strategic plan and evaluate a strategic plan in terms of technology. But here, they put the entire plan into generative AI tool and have it do a critique and then write a two, three page summary. Again, uh, option to that is to do a naturalistic study. So here, maybe students could do a naturalistic study of how students are using ChatGPT in their own um, informal and formal settings. Or perhaps have ChatGPT write a study report for you and then write a critique about it, a reflection on it, or a software technology review, um, whatever te software technology tool or platform that you are interested, maybe have it create a book review or a review in Amazon that gets posted, right? And then write a reflection on that. Um, I also have students option, they can do a video of their learning or a video on, they can create a video in YouTube or some other technology. And they could use ChatGPT or Claude or Bard to write the script for that video or just a starter of the script, the, the rough draft of the script out there. Another brave people option in my class is to do an issues paper, a challenges in the field paper on, and have them uh, um, identify and summarize what are the challenges and what are the options to that and create maybe have um, ChatGPT create a starter list of the challenges and have you elaborate on them? Have you extend them? You can use this in many different ways, right? The same way, oh, in this class, I have syllabi going back decades and you could have ChatGPT analyze the different syllabi for the classes and generators. And this is a really difficult thing for students to do, have it generate the themes that and how they've changed over the years and over the decades of teaching the same class since 1990. Um, when I was eight years old. <laughs> Another brave people option, create a usable class project. So you could have ChatGPT help you create a glossary for the class that you could in turn share to the entire group in the class and have as a going away present to everyone. You could have ChatGPT helping you create something valuable, archivable, um, historical in nature that everyone can rally around like an interactive multimedia glossary, like a website or a database for a website relating to all the articles for the class, something, a usable class project or a client-based project. Many classes, many higher ed classes entail or have as an option working with a client in the real world, an internship, a practicum experience of some kind, uh, whether it's helping and do a evaluation for that organization or company or institution or writing a white paper or a strategic plan or visioning statement. You could have ChatGPT help you in that regard, getting ready to do such a report or create such a resource. And then, but document how you used it. Um, cite ChatGPT uh, and how you've used it. There are websites that tell you how you can cite the tools. 
Um, you can use generative AI to help you in any kind of product that you or project that you're working on. And, and my last option is a student determined project. Anything, students can, the final assignment can be anything, but document how you utilize generative AI in that. In my other, in one of my other classes, we have debates, issue debates. And I had students last semester utilize chat PDF and chat GPT to help them write their papers on the pro and con side of different debates, you know, which you'll see as a theme in this uh, set in this particular talk today. A 16th way in which I'm using chat uh, generative AI, in this case, chat PDF, is to put articles in before I might lecture, put articles into chat PDF and ask it, in this article, what are the key themes? In this article, what are questions I could ask students? So if Bo and I are behind in our reading, and Bo, Bo's never behind in reading, he's my assistant, I'm sometimes behind, I can quickly put it in chat PDF and summarize the article. Well, this article is my article just published, so I can't, couldn't even remember what is my article. And here it comes up with five or four questions that I can ask. And in and, and the summary, here's a list of takeaways from the article, self-directed learning, our self-directed online learning is rapidly growing field that encompasses a wide range of learning environments. SDL learners seek environments that offer freedom, choice, control, autonomy, and both learners and instructors have intrinsic motive. Oh yeah, that's what I wrote about. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is the first set of ideas. Second set, second set comes from Cornell University in New York. Beautiful place if you've never been to Cornell. What a lovely campus that is. Well, the Teaching and Learning Center at Cornell seems to pop up a lot. When I did a talk on diversity, equity, and inclusion and wanted to know about instructional design issues, Cornell, Columbia Teachers College, um, Carnegie Mellon, Michigan, Indiana, and a couple other places. But Cornell, when I typed last night, what should I be look, thinking about for AI pedagogy? Up comes Cornell, but also came South Carolina, University of South Carolina, um, where I used to have a partnership project a long time ago. Northern Illinois University popped up. What is ChatGPT? What can we do about ChatGPT? Privacy. <laughs> Their Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. It's not just Northern Illinois. It's not just South Carolina. Every university probably in the world was dealing and struggling with, what do we do now? And there were, you know, at least 10% of them have generated reports. There's tons of reports about ChatGPT and other things. But the one that caught my fancy was Cornell because Cornell is pretty thorough and it's all free. You know, they're offering faculty guidance for teaching in this age, not just talking about it, not just, you know, cautioning about it. They're offering guidance on how to do it. You know, in maths, in social sciences, in programming, in law, in music, in, in language learning, in physical sciences, engineering, as I said, literature, art, they've got it all in there and some guidelines and recommendations and so forth. And I thought, fascinating. So I grabbed a few, I put a few in here. They're not my ideas, they're from professors at Cornell, okay? You can download this entire free report right now. Just click on the, oh, you gotta download the, the slides to click on the link. So download the slides, trainingshare.com or go to Contact North after this show, after this session. So activity number 17, the first one from Cornell. Computer programming, of course. Debugging, right? Coding assignments, comparing human solutions to AI solutions. So having you diagnose, students diagnose an issue, a problem in the code and describe what the coding problem is. But then put the same computer code snippet into generative AI and see what it finds. What does it find different problems or issues in that code. And you compare the student generated issues with the computer generated ones. In a more high level advanced class, they were looking at other things in addition to just a code by code comparison and more in terms of feasibility of the code and what it can do, right? And, you know, test, uh, produce um, a test case that can, that the students can evaluate, right? Assess the code output to see if it provided full coverage for what you're attempting to do, not just the nitty gritty kinds of things, but the big picture, the human readable specification of the software system itself. Also from computer science engineering, we into physics, 
might want to arouse curiosity in physics with a general prompt. If I weigh myself at the equator, will I weigh more or less than at the North Pole? Well, ChatGPT says, yes, your weight would differ slightly at the equator in the North Pole, but the difference is quite small. And then you provoke some curiosity with this scientific finding, and you have students do their own measurement activity. So use ChatGPT as a curiosity engine to provoke or rouse minds to life, as Vygotsky would say, right? And you know, in engineering, we might ask questions about different theories and different um, concepts. Students might ask ChatGPT, can, can generative AI, uh, prompt generative AI with a question such as, what are the underlying assumptions in beam theory? ChatGPT might say, linear elasticity. Beam theory assumes that the material in beam behaves el elastically and follows Hooke's law, it determines that the beam material is isotropic and that it deforms linearly through applied loads. I have no clue what that means, but the students certainly must because they won't pass the course in, if, unless they do. Ask students then to reflect on ChatGPT's response and the accuracy of it because we all know ChatGPT uh, uh, hallucinates, right? Mathematical proofs. Ask students to prompt generative AI to prove a solution to the 2D set steady state heat equation and whether it's unique. ChatGPT will return. To prove uniqueness of the solution of 2D steady state heat equation, we can use this method of contradiction. And it goes on and on and on. Well, then you might ask the students to ask the question in a slightly different way and see what, this, what it would give you for the solution based on the type of question that you're asking, okay? Pro and con debates I've already mentioned, but you might have generative AI create a pro and con arguments for an upcoming debate. And then the students take that with them and add to other materials that they're reading, have them come back to class and engage in the debate. Have each student ask ChatGPT different questions maybe or different approaches and they get different pro and con arguments potentially, or maybe utilizing different AI tools, Bard and Claude and Chat P GPT and others, right? And then have them reflect on what happened in the debate, right? Maybe have these giant systems out there, these you know generative AI language model systems, summarize meetings such as congressional meetings, such as corporate earnings reports and other things. Maybe you're taking a finance class and you have ChatGPT summarize. The financials. Now, I used to be an accountant. I did this in the old days. I don't do it anymore. But summarize for the students those financial reports and have students write different uh, reports based on that, memos based on that, and then discuss them and critically analyze what AI put in the summary transcript and what it was missing and lacking. Uh, Kurt, students... we're at the 1040, just let you know. Thank you. Uh, students, and come in in 10 minutes again and remind me. Um, you might assess the validity and of sources for the accuracy and, and bias within the resources that they find. So generative AI might find sources for an assignment. Students review those resources and evaluate their usefulness and then go and find additional resources from which they then create some kind of a reference list or bibliography of resources that are relevant and high quality and reliable. Maybe they create two lists, a list that were not found to be as reliable and those that are, and they talk about the differences between the two lists as a large group of students and critique or evaluate what ChatGPT or other generative AI found and for looking for their bias of what they found. There, there are all sorts of biases out there today as we are all well aware and um, you might look for the assumptions in what they had found. Editing skills, pre-work for discussion or an in-class activity. I call this two heads are better than one. Have students edit a, a paragraph, maybe out of Sam Nadu's distance education journal, just edit it, or a short paper, a little reflection paper from Sam's uh, journal, distance ed, using a prompt that makes sense, make, this paragraph more concise, strengthen the argument, explain the concept, have students then run that same short paper, that same paragraph or page through chat GPT or generative AI, and look at the differences between what the students found 
in editing that work and what generative AI found. Now, in this instead, there are no errors. They wouldn't find anything. So you have to go to another journal or you know another resource out there, right? I know some's got high quality people. It's a top level journal out there. Um, but then have them reflect on what they found and their final edits and so forth. Have them reflect on um, the differences between the AI augmented evaluation and the human, again, human AI. Um, revise for a new audience. So you might have a paper that's written or a two-page proposal that's written for one audience, and then you're asked to write it for a totally different audience. Maybe you wrote, write something for a scientific audience and then translate it for the lay person out there, lay people out there, and have generative AI help you shorten that paper for the lay person, for the community, potentially. And then look at how generative AI helped you in modifying that particular paper and improved it and so forth and reflect on that. Or maybe you have Generative AI generate outlines for written reports, summaries, the executive summary maybe for a report. That'd be an interesting, or at least a draft of an executive summary. You know, having them assist in that and then um, have the students modify that outline and maybe extend it or uh, evaluate it or look for the coherence within it and critically reflect on its help in the process. Um, again, generative AI is a peer editor. So giving you constructive feedback on your writing, uh, improving your writing. I know Alicia's with us here, right, Alicia? We, we had so we just ask it for, you know, let, what, what can we put to, you know, what, what's wrong with this paper? Can you flag grammar things or syntax things and so forth? Um, just, so this one is probably the most widely used, you know, I'm guessing, or one of the most widely used ideas out there. You just have it look for surface level kinds of mistakes, just Grammarly, right? Grammarly is a tool that does this kind of stuff. Any of these grammar checkers, it's doing exactly this, right? Uh, but then you start noticing patterns within your own writing of things that you're doing wrong and maybe you ameliorate them. Maybe you have a new strategy for writing based on common errors that you've been making. Brainstorming ideas for an assignment. Students are often, oh, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. Well. If you have, let's have ChatGPT brainstorm some of my possibilities for you. It's like in the old days, John and some. So in the old days, you know, we we had project galleries for 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 in service teachers here in Indiana. We had prior years of the project, and we make a project gallery of all prior student work, and we put them on display. And all the panicked teachers out there would look at the project gallery and say, "I can do this. I can do this." Well, same here. You can have ChatGPT brainstorm some ideas. <gasps> Oh, that's not a bad idea. And then they run with the idea, right? So it gets their brain working a bit, you know? It's it's like when, you know, Bo asked me to write a rec letter. Bo, can you give me a few sentences to what I'm going to put in that rec letter? And I'll, then I'll write it, you know? Just, you, you got to get off the, you know, the 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 blank page, you know, just get some ideas to, to start, right? And then maybe have students discuss those, the merits of the different ideas. Or compare and contrast. Maybe have... You know, generative AI talk about Roman civilization or Greek civilization or academic writing, whatever it is. And then the student reads an article about that and compares their summary to the ChatGPT summary uh, and look at what ChatGPT got right, wrong, or missed. So, having again, human computer, human technology, human AI comparisons. Number three. So, this is the free book I mentioned earlier, part three. We're at quarter two. 101 ideas to use AI in education, a crowdsourced collection from Chrissy Nar Naranzi, Sandra, I'll just say Mariana, Antonio, Chrissy, and, Sa and Sandra. <laughs> and it, it, again, it's freely available 2023. And they keep updating this. It's really cool. They keep updating this thing. So yeah, so one idea I really liked last night. I'm going to hear, you know, it's... Uh, it should say activity, uh, yeah, uh, uh, number one there. It's the first one in the whole darn thing. Generating feedback, poetry, you know, getting, typing in the feedback that you want to give to students, putting it into chat GPT and have them write a poem on that feedback. <laughs> you know, tight students uh, into, you know, well, how they're going to fix their paper or what, you know, how good their, their mid midterm assignment was. <laughs> that takes a little courage maybe the first time to try something like that, but, you know, or create generative art, you know, 
using Dolly, right? So we have an eagle soaring in the, the, the distance. So, you know, this is this is a eagle flying in the clear blue skies, open wings. This means you're pretty darn good. You're, you're don't, you got A plus, <laughs> whereas others might get the dragon <laughs> uh, and so forth. So, yeah. Um, that that's one idea anyhow actually idea 97 in there if you download the whole darn thing the rest of them will come in order so idea number four gets at ethics and digital literacy so you might have dolly again generate an image based on the topic that you're you're trying to discuss whether it might be you know personal data and the impacts of privacy uh, or in inclusivity issues or other things and have it generate some kind of images to kind of help strike um, accord with people as they read the article. And this goes back to Richard Mayer's work on multimedia for learning, right? If we can have, I think these would be more interesting than the reading the reading vanilla bland textbooks that we normally are, are, are subjected to, right? To read something that might be more interesting here. And have, maybe have ChatGPT be a quiz master and creating interactive kinds of quizzes like who wants to be a millionaire? Um, my friend Mala Bali in American University in Cairo, I had a good chance of fortune of visiting her in September. She's utilizing ChatGPT, and I had a chat with her students about how they're using ChatGPT. And she has idea 13 in here, and she calls it a wolf in sheep's clothing, it's, um, a conversation starter where something might look really good and, and effective as an idea, but you have to look at the underlying principles of use and the ethical considerations thereof, like the exploitation of Kenyan workers. When we start talking about um, the, all, the, all the resources that are being made available through ChatGPT today, um, you have to start thinking about who's providing those resources and in what climates they're doing so and how much they're being paid for doing so and, and so on and so forth. Idea number 20 in the book is utilizing ChatGPT for active learning ideas. Uh, and here they talk about having a think pair share activity where you have two students who are both asking ChatGPT different questions using different kinds of prompts um, and so forth and comparing their results that they've gotten compare and in a paired exchange and look for the differences and the surprises and curiosities along the way. So this makes for more interesting kinds of activities, I think, for your students. I think think pair share activities are always of value because you're now getting um, to interact about your ideas as well as to hear someone else talk about what they got from something without going to the larger group and being maybe embarrassed by what you had to say. You can start talking within a small team and find out if your ideas can, uh, resonate with someone else before maybe sharing it with others. Another Dolly idea um, or Dolly 2, idea would be to have it create something, whatever it is, create a new model for XYZ, create a new concept, create a new plant, create a new species, create a new piece of furniture, um, architecture, have it create a new house, just to have it as an idea spurring, you know, um, activity within your class, a generative activity. So again, going back to here, if you think this is a value, this will go in creative thinking. Remember, we've got the four parts here, and hopefully you've written down a few things in there uh, that you can use. I won't pick on Deb Patterson because I know Deb's got lots of ideas up there in Indianapolis. Um, so I won't mention anything that, that uh, I'm sorry, Deb. Do I say Deb Patterson? Okay. <laughs> Rewriting AI, AI image with AI image generator. So here you might have students writing in a journal, in a blog, and having um, Dolly create an image based on your blog posts. You know, they're talking about maybe having students you know, create some kind of uh, their own personal biographies or their memoirs uh, and so forth. So we're at 10 to, I see that. We have 10 minutes left. Yep, great. Uh, idea number 39, a chat GPT as a debate partner. And here you've got, you know, a student standing up in class presenting a debate against chat GPT while other students are seated next to him. Uh, and, you know, Student feedback on this showed that they found debating a useful way to explore and improve their knowledge on a topic and improve their skills in teamwork, communication, and critical thinking. It puts them on the spot, sort of. They have to really do more work. They have to be smarter than the machine, hopefully. You know, and you know, having you know, ChatGPT, you know, fostering critical thinking, stimulating critical thinking by letting students figure out a question in a particular domain, 
in one class in uh, South Africa. I guess we got a lot of people from Stellenbach with us today in Cape Town. Welcome, South Africa, people from South Africa. I love having people from South Africa with us. Um, you know, um, asking that ChatGPT answer a question and then write a mini essay, you know, providing both positive and negative criticism of what ChatGPT produced. So evaluating, evaluate, analyze, right? Reflect, reflect, reflect on what's produced. And have an inter in interactive role play, chat, discussion with historical figures, right? Have it assume the, the persona of Napoleon Bonaparte or Marie Antoinette or some figure in time and have it respond to different prompts that you give it then. You could have ChatGPT create authentic case scenarios and problems that you assign to different groups. You assign maybe each of six groups in your class a, 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 a different case problem, as well as later, maybe after they've solved the case, give it the solution that ChatGPT came up with to compare their solution to the technology-based solutions out there. I know many of my colleagues utilize case-based discussions in their classrooms, and they take seven hours often to generate one case. And I got a friend in anat who teaches anatomy. Um, here's one way in which you can have six cases generated within a few minutes, right? But then you may have to refine them and evaluate them. One interesting one is idea number 73 is having an AI podcast show. Oh, wow. An AI podcast. So you have a, a technology voice. You have, you have chat GPT generated content. But we see this happening already today with journalists out there often being AI bots, right? See, all these journalists laid off just in this past month. I was watching a bit of tea. I don't watch much TV, but they're saying this is a freaky thing that's happening out there. Eventually, we're going to be reading our newspaper. It's all going to be written by bots. So why not have an AI podcast in the morning show? <laughs> why not? Um, so those are the within the 101 idea books. There's another application from Charles Darwin, a 25 applications in teaching and assessment from Seb Dianati and Suman Laudari from Charles Darwin University with John Mason over there. Thanks for providing that, John. Um, and if you've not read John's work, I highly recommend that you take a look at his work at Charles Darwin. And the same with my friend Sam Nadu who's joined us here today. Um, so they talk about how you can have ChatGPT help you create rubrics, spark debates, um, do YouTube summaries, or create different kinds of assessments or tutorials for your students. I just picked out a couple, again, case-based learning designed for real world case studies on supply and demand for first year microeconomics students, include the answers to the problem, then include a lesson associated with those cases. Have students connect the cases to the real world, authentic learning in their, their real life setting. Have them talk about what, how, what they've experienced relates to the case of ChatGPT created. Um, and, and then discuss the differences within the class or anything that came up within the groups. Or maybe having create lists, the 10 most common misconceptions between Carl Jung's research and Freud's research, right? And then have it create a set, set of questions that students might ask in a discussion form later in Canvas or whatever learning management system that you might be using. Or have ChatGPT create a JavaScript or an, a, um, some kind of programming code that you can utilize and test out potentially with first year programming students with different examples and solutions and issues and common mistakes that they might encounter uh, or interact with. Have it develop icebreakers that you might utilize in class. I have done this asking ChatGPT, what, what can I do today as a starter activity for, the, for my class? Or what maybe side questions could I send to the remote students that they might, you know, they might get them back on, you know, if they've they've gotten a little off track for a bit, might, you know, get them reconnected with the class. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Paul Kim at Stanford has developed SMILE, Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environments. And my friend, my colleague, Dr. Tron Fon at Fresno State is using Paul's tool to have students ask questions. And it evaluates the questions from five different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. What would happen if the human if human mobility what would happen to human mobility if gravity decreased by twenty five percent? And Smile said, "Great job! This question meets the criteria of level five. It describes an uncertain situation and utilizes a, con a conditional structure to prompt creative thinking. Such a solution would indeed have significant implications in human mobility." 
So Smile and now Smile Up is free. Smile Up is free tool based. Um, it has an AI engine underneath it that has students um, evaluating different questions and it evaluates students' questions. So we get at critical thinking skills, logic, reasoning kinds of skills, making well-informed judgments and analyzing, synthesizing and so forth. Idea 49. Uh, utilizing um, AI as prompts for critical analysis. Having um, in this assignment, students are provided with AI-generated um, text relevant to the course, and then are asked to comment, expand, review, and they track changes. And then they print out maybe the paper with the track changes, and they compare the modified version to the original version and look at, you know, offer critiques on what AI had originally um, uh, provided for them. This professor uses a tool called Hypothesis to have students annotate. Instead of having track changes, he uses Hypothesis, which I might get the people of Hypothesis into my class this semester to talk about um, annotating one's work and how it augments their learning and extends one's learning in, in his classes in um, history of the civil rights. Uh, this professor just says, I want the students just to utilize ChatGP and everything, formative and summative evaluation, because it, it, you know, it is a tool for synthesis and summarization. I, thought, I want them you know, to try, try it out, just want them to use it. He teaches introductory education and diversity classes. You know, you might ask it, you know, ChatGPT to design the perfect government as this professor at Northland Community and Technical College does and compares the, the ChatGPT response to the student earlier discussions that happened a few weeks earlier in class and has to compare the results. This professor provides three anonymized texts, one of which created by AI, two are from humans and has the students evaluate the reliability, factuality, and internal reasoning within those three texts. So then they discover which one was the AI-driven one, University of Miss Mississippi professor. Um, here at, Indian, at um, Ohio Wesleyan University, this professor has students engage with AI-generated artifacts and compare their output, again, to their own. So this is, seems to be a common theme. This is in a class on motivation and learning strategies course, trying to promote student metacognition and thinking. Again, having the students compare the contents developed by AI bot to their own. Uh, and finally, um, MIT people were utilizing ChatGPT uh, and other technologies to, in a film ha filmmaking hackathon to generate scripts, to generate films, to generate ideas and so forth. You might utilize Hey PI. Now, Hey PI is a tool for you to have conversations with uh, maybe about you know life and family and so forth. You know, just to break us out of our loneliness out there and burnout out and so forth. Well, this Hey PI tool could also be used to develop counseling skills and social work skills and so forth in in disciplines where there's a lot of interaction and conversation and so forth. I'll skip over just having tools generate lists and guides and plans. This is in here, having Dolly generate cartoon scripts and compare the, you know, the, the ideas that Dolly creates to what ChatGPT would provide in terms of a, um, a, a text-based summary um, and so forth. I'm just going to skip over that. The fourth area, the final area gets us into language learning. We're about one minute away. I'll just mention a couple of things. Language learning is a lot of possibilities. It's where my research is today. I've done We've got four papers related to ChatGPT for language learning among YouTubers who teach languages online. Two are published, two are in review. Happy to send that. Um, but you know, there's bias in ChatGPT. There's limited creativity in ChatGPT. There's syntax errors or grammatical errors, lack of empathy, lots of problems. But still in language learning, you can have it generate vocabulary quizzes, um, synonyms and antonyms. Um, you could have it uh, vocabulary lists and so forth. You can have it create definitions, advertisements, dialogues in different languages, this being Chinese, explanations in different languages, um, questions, comprehension questions that you could have, um, uh, dialogues for advanced learners for of a language, for beginning kind of learners, have it create different dialogues or scripts or cases based on the level of language that students are at. Uh, have it create uh, vocabulary lists and so forth and explanations of vocabulary or assessments. Finally, you can go to lots of resources online like the Cornell report, but UNESCO also has a new report, Guidance for Generative AI in Education. 
free to download, free to take a look at. I, there are a lot of resources already that are out there. And I encourage you to take a look at, at them. I encourage you to download my slides. I encourage you to contact me if, if you'd like me to send you something uh, that I've talked about today, if you can't find it. Uh, we go to poll number five in here. Will instructors be replaced by ChatGPT and generative AI? If it's John Mason, it's definitely not. You can't replace that guy. You know, I can't replace Bo, who's been helping me for the last couple of semesters. He's brilliant. Even though he's up at Purdue land in Lafayette, I, you know, he's still, there's a lot of brilliant people at Purdue. Uh, definitely not. I'll wait and see. Perhaps some instructors might, mostly. We got 52, 54. Okay. Um, if you could reveal the results. So definitely not, uh, didn't win. Perhaps some instructors might just slightly nudged it out. <laughs> so we got about half and half. Okay, we can go to the next poll in there. Um, get to number six in here. Closing question. How many teaching, tutoring and training ideas did you get from this session? All this is brand new. I've <clears throat> the only slides from last time were just to remind you what models I presented. So a lot of this is new to me. Um, so I'm curious if it, it, it struck a chord. And uh, why don't you reveal the results? Got 55, 56, 57, 58, 50, okay. So why don't you go ahead and reveal the results? And a lot of you got more than 10 ideas. Okay, so I met, more than met my goal of one or two um, everyone got at least one or two. Great. Uh, great. Thank you very much. And the next question, number seven, how many learning ideas did you get? For, so those are, you know, how many learning ideas did you get from this session? Okay, let's get at least 50 in there. We have 50, 51, 52. Okay, want we reveal the results. 51 people out of 88 that are left. Again, more than 10, 41%, only 14%, one or two. So I, again, met my goal of at least a couple ideas getting from this. Um, so we can exit out of this, of the questions. And in the chat window, if you could for me, um, just, um, let's see if I can get this in here. I've, if we had part three, I've done part one in November, part two in February, if we had a part three, what would you want um, on, uh, us to talk about in terms of generative AI? If we had part three on a, of a talk on generative AI, or maybe on a talk that's not generative AI, what do you want um, uh, Sarah to, to schedule someone else to talk about in terms of AI and education? So. Uh, in terms of generative AI, in terms of AI in general, what should they they address? What should they hit upon? And I took all my things off, so I have, can't read them yet. I will point out that my book is available at techvariety.com for free. My books, I go to my homepage, kurtbonk.com, and you can download free research special issue, free book, free book, and a not free book, but a new book. <laughs> um, lots of resources are up there at Publication Share. All my free articles are at Publication Share. All my talks are at Training Share. So again, thank you for coming to this uh, session. I'm gonna put back on, I can hopefully show my video panel and hopefully show my um, floating media controls Oh, now we've got everything. Okay, great. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point, and maybe I can read the chat that's been showing up here. I haven't seen any of it. Um, so thank you to Cheryl. Um, thank you to Noriko, former students of mine, for coming in here. Thank you, Patty, Amy, Keitha, Alicia, Lena, Manuel. Does anyone have questions for me? Thank you, Stella. Edgar. All right, there's a few in the uh, Q&A tool. Um, I don't know if you want me to read them. Yes, sure. And thanks okay. to Deb Patterson again in here and lively conversation, Deb and Harry Singh. Thank you. Okay, well, this was, 
Go ahead. Lastly, over time, and we'll do these, and then we'll uh, then we'll close up. Um, Alistar asks, apologies if I missed this, but what about copyright in terms of image generation or even brainstorming? Well, image generation and brainstorming, uh, that is a concern because I am thinking about some a project I'm working, I'm going to be working on next, this coming summer. Um, that's something you're going to have to talk to your uh, uh, law people about because I'm not an expert at copyright. I was an expert at it for like a one month, I gave a talk on copyright back in 2001 or two. And the next month I couldn't speak on it anymore because it goes, you know, it's, it's different wherever you are, every state, every um, jurisdiction. So I will not, I, 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 I can't answer it, but I can say if it's generating a unique image, you probably don't have to worry. If it's generating unique text, you don't have to worry, but you don't know, right? So you always want to rewrite, redo. You don't want to turn in what ChatGPT creates right? You want to redo it. You don't want to publish the image that you that Dolly has created, but you can use it in your classes. You have fair use to 10% of a book, right? At least in the US. Again, I do know a little bit about copyright. So you can, you know, utilize some images within your class, but you wouldn't want to publish and sell them, right? You'd want to talk to your attorney um, or your, your legal, legal advice from someone. And, and if you're going to publish with Rutledge or you know, McGraw Hill or some pub Pearson or some public, they will have the people that will analyze and decide on that or get the rights and permissions for it. So I would say instructionally, a few uh, images, I wouldn't worry about. If you're using it professionally in a, in a marketing standpoint, then I would worry. Um, does that make sense, Sarah? Yep, it sure does. Um, the next one's from Shane. As a former visual arts teacher, how would I integrate AI into a class while still promoting the creative thinking and manual skills as artists? Hmm. Not being an artist myself, at least that um, I'm a writer, I guess that would be a, some form of art, right? And so you're asking whether as people utilize digital technologies, whether they there would be a lapse in their capability of using traditional tools for development of art. That's partly a personal decision that one has to make for one, what, what you ex would expect of your students to be learning about. It was the same question asked though 20, 30, 40 years ago about calculators when I was an accountant, right? So the use of calculators was deemed to kind of cause us to lose our mathematical skills. So they were banned in schools. They were banned in um, my statistics classes. They, my professor in statistics wouldn't let people bring in their calculators with them. Um, was that a good decision on his part? Um, were, 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 we utilize, were we learning better statistics because we were manually generating uh, all those statistical equations and you know, summarizing and creating all the different um, descriptive statistics out there? I don't think so. Um, but again, you'll have to make a decision about that. And you might do a 50-50 and have, have retro day in your class where they're utilizing traditional uh, art forms, or you might have combo day or hybrid day where they're mixing and matching what techniques they were utilizing prior to digital. And maybe trying to find a space or a place or a manner in which we could merge both worlds together. This is a hybrid world that, that we have. And again, I'm not teaching that particular media production or art visualization course. So I don't know the specifics, but that's at least I'd think about or reflect upon, or at least have them critique what was happening done in the past or experience what was happening and then write a reflection on it compared to uh, maybe having create something both in a digital way and a traditional way and then do a comparison. That'd be one way to keep those skills alive. We have a third question. Yeah, the first question is from Lauren. Uh, lots of what makes AI useful is how students can reflect on its products. How do we ensure the student reflection isn't AI generated? That's a good question. So if you're teaching face-to-face, -face, you could have them start on those reflections with you in class, maybe as a final thing that they do. And as they walk out the door, they're turning in slips um, of their starts to the reflections that they're work, going to work on at home for their assignment for that day. That's one way to have them at least um, generate something that you can look at and compare to it but also having early writing samples of all your students in the class. And this is what has been done for <clears throat> in online space for decades already. We've been doing this for 
three decades now, almost two, three decades, collecting early writing samples and then comparing their writing to that early writing sample. Uh, and then you kind of, that's one indicator of the plagiarism that might have taken place with the generative AI tool. Um, another way is to have them work in teams or pairs so they have their peer as a check against the plagiarism. Um, that That's all, I'll, I'll write to me. There's like 30 different ways to reduce plagiarism. We cannot totally eliminate it. And I, without going into a long talk about what happens in traditional classrooms, that those are a couple initial ideas anyhow. Those are wonderful questions, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. I thank Sarah for organizing this and inviting me back in here. And anyone who I've had the privilege of getting to know in the past who've come to this session, I thank you very much for my friends and colleagues for, for being with me. Thank you for all the new people I've never met before who attended. Please reach out. Please send me an email at cjbonk at iu.edu or at indiana.edu, cjbonk. Um, and um, I hope to connect with all of you in the near future somewhere around the world. Thank you all. It's been delight, delightful to be with you today and to be with Contact North. It's such an important and exciting time where Contact North is making a difference in the world and expanding its outreach and its mission beyond Ontario to the rest of the world to help those who are working with these emerging technologies for learning discover, reflect on, and utilize in new and important and exciting ways so that this new generation of learners can learn in more powerful, transformative ways than it's ever been done before. I thank Contact North. I thank Maxim John Luis, the you know CEO and head of Contact North. And Sarah as well. The two of them and wonderful people. And Ron Ostin, who's doing a lot of work with them. It's unbelievable what they've been able to do the past few years. Take a look. They bring the best people in the world doing free webinars. This isn't the only one. Sign up for one of those webinars. Sign up for their mailing list. Everything's free. You're not committing to anything do take a look. Also, Commonwealth of Learning, do take a look at these free resources and get ramped up. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kurt. It was always a pleasure having you. It's always an engaging and inspirational webinar. Uh, I hope our participants are able to take some of these great nuggets of information, and apply them in their own practice. So thank you again, Kurt. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your day for joining us. And uh, I wish you a great rest of your day, of your Thursday. All right, take care. Thank Bye. You.